again at the Cable Easel program with Painting from Life. And this is part two of a study which I began called the Robert Moses State Park. And um, it's a wonderful dune scene to pay homage and appreciate uh, the amazing resources that we have here on this island, which uh, we have to begin to really protect and really pay attention to what's happening to it. And so when I take you out, and now with channel one, meaning that we can go farther afield, meaning that I can, in fact, point out all the amazing and wonderf wondrous things that take place here and that are available to everybody, all the citizenry, as well as anybody who decides to want to come and visit from another place. They can come here and go to places like this and discover what is here, which is in, which is in multiple numbers of wonders. The, um, this is the, uh, as you, as you may, if you were in on the first part of this program, this is the, um, uh, the place on uh, the Moses, Robert Moses Causeway, uh, uh, turnabout, which is called the Water Tower. Um, there's nobody quite sure wh whether there's water in there or not, but um, that's the identifying tower. It's got its own particular color, its own particular shape. I'm sure that ships at sea have used that uh, for a little while. I'm not sure how long it's been there, but I would probably say it was in the 30s or the 40s that it was put up. And then these amazing dunes that are around, that surround it, like a great, great waves of sand surrounding this this particular landmark. Um, I, uh, the, the first part was the laying it out, and the second part now is going to be devoted to the, maybe, possibly the more tedious aspect of doing paintings of dunes. But uh, there are so many bad paintings of dunes that I thought that I would try to see if I could do a better one and uh, tell you what the pitfalls are of how you handle dunes. Uh, there are some that are out there for sale, and they're always the same dune. It's a, it's a split in the, um, in the sand, and then there's a little triangle of uh, sea just beyond it, and then there's a seagull or two flying and that's called a dune painting. But actually, I would like to be far more specific about what these dunes are like, especially at different times of the year. Now, um, there is a certain, uh, there's a certain sort of a faded quality to these, sand, to these grasses that have been blowing in the wind now since uh, a low September and October of, uh, of 1992. And now they are on the verge of becoming uh, green once again, but l a lot of them are now uh, amber toned, a little bit orange in places, and they are just maybe beginning to uh, to uh, change from the pale yellow that they turn in the winter time when they really are in their sleeping stage. They're never dead. Uh, the amazing part about these uh, about these beach, beach grasses is that they are so resilient, and they can be buffeted and whacked at by the uh, by the weathers of all kinds, and they will come back just as strong and just as beautiful in the the coming season. So here we have. Uh, the need to portray what these things do. Now, all of these these dunes have got little uh, gullies and little places that run down, and their, de their demarcations are the growths of grass. Um, they are definitely uh, part of a, of a general pattern, and the grasses grow in the gullies. They also grow sometimes in sort of a feathery things on the tops of the of the little hills, but uh, but they um, they can't just be arbitrarily stuck in there as grasses because they do have a pattern. Um, the um 
uh, the uh, darkness in the sand at this time of year, and I showed you in the first program about the sand that, um, that is down there. It's been dredged up uh, over these winter storms, and the color of the beach, as you can see where me working here, is very mauve and so, uh, slightly pale, pale um, wine-colored sand. It's really quite remarkable. I'm using this brush to do what I call scumbling the grass. Um, I like to have the impression of what this grass is, rather than every single uh, blade. This is what uh, you would probably call more painterly. When you get to the foreground, you can give a little bit more detail, but when it is far enough out of focus, you have to try to just give the impression of what these grasses do. Uh, and by that, you will. Uh, I, li I like to be able to pay attention to the textures that are involved. As you come down here, there's another little hill that rises up here, and the grasses are growing along that one. Um, the, uh, the gulls, there were not many. There were not many brave gulls uh, venturing out over this part of the ocean when this uh, scene was being shot, but the gulls were definitely in the Great South Bay. And guess what? The uh, Canada geese uh, must have been looking at their calendar because they were flying overhead and they were walking along the beach and they were, uh, well, resting and whatever they're doing, I think they're on their way back to Montreal. They have been gone apparently all winter and wise they were too because they've been smacked with a a rather heavy winter up there, but the Canada geese are out there. This is the time to see them. Quite wonderful to see these beasts, well, beasts, they're not beasts, they're wonderful looking birds with long necks and they're very uh, rich black uh, feathers uh, on, on their very sturdy bodies. And they were out there on the Great South Bay in very number of places, overhead and on the beaches and so on. So uh, there's another uh, bonus about uh, driving out there, enough with the, with the uh, visiting the mall business. It's get out and look at those wonderful Canada geese. The kids will go bonkers when they see them because they're huge and they do, in fact, uh, they are rot not tame, but they do not uh, fly and go crazy if you, go get, uh, if you get near them. They'll go away, but uh, they're visible from just about everywhere. And it's wonderful to see them coming back. Uh, I don't know where they've been, but I suspect Buenos Aires or maybe the Falkland Islands or maybe the even, even as far down as the um, uh, Cape of uh, Tierra del Fuego, wherever that is, the southern part of, the, um, of South America. But um, they're on their way back, and that's another sign that we can all uh, say, well, time to take out the shorts because we're almost there. Uh, the, um, however, the color scheme of a winter landscape is, uh, is as delicious, I think, as the, as the summer one. Now, I'm coming as I talk to you about all these things, I'm coming forward with the leaves, with the grasses that are in the foreground. Now they can be much more definite and much more, and they don't have to be scumbled and tried to, uh, and, and diffused because they are definitely um, much more visible. They're in the field of focus. This is what, what I'm talking about, that not only is there color focus, but there is also um, line focus. Things that are far away tend to be out of focus somewhat. Uh, no matter how good your eyes are, the details are lost in the distance. Um, before I forget, I'd like to put some of these darker places on on here. Uh, they are um, they're clumps that are that are extremely dark, but they're very identifiable and and they're unexplained. But they give that nice texture to this otherwise. Um, just great display of grasses growing in rows, but there are these dark places, and they are, they just sort of pepper the the area with their darknesses. Um, whatever they are, I'm not sure. They're probably shells casting shadows, as far as I can think. Um, now I have a rather large clump over here. This clump is um, very busy. It's uh, got all sorts of colors in it as well, but it dominates the uh, lower part of this of this work and I have to make sure that I can pull it off. It blows in the wind rather rather um, uh, agitatingly and um, because it is um, it's there's, it's a large plant and there's a lot of it but um, it's got its heads and uh, these are these um, as, as I remember at one time these may have been called uh, um, spearheads. Uh, I know that when I was little and I would be taken to the beach on the Mediterranean uh, there were tall grasses with these pointy things and they were, we always called them spearheads. Uh, these are growing in great clumps down, uh, down there right now. They're probably uh, uh, harboring some wonderful kind of 
well, seed that is going to come out in the summertime, make everybody sneeze. But nevertheless, they are, they are down there blowing in the wind. They're very slender. I'm, I did my first one much too, it's much too fat. So I maybe will take that off. And I, I don't ever mind making a mistake so that I can show you how to correct it. And correcting something that is too fat, and, and I don't mean to seem picky about it, but if it's too fat, it loses its identity. It's no longer what I'm talking about. It's no longer this particular grass. So, um, uh, so don't hesitate to correct something if it, if it gets too fat and you want to be accurate about what you're painting. Uh, by all means, do it right then and there. But these nice, wonderful spears, dark spears that um, are, are, are in the wind down there. And this, here's one that right in the foreground and it's, and, it's, and, it's, um, and it's very tall and it comes all the way down to the foreground. It gives a nice feeling of authenticity to it. So here we have the need to make this great, big, uh, important clump in the foreground. This is part, this is an important part of this composition because it dominates such a large space. And uh, it is the balance between this and the tower, which is all the way over in the distance. So you've got two main um, points of interest. And um, you can have it just as a clump of weeds. A weeds, um, a weeds can be clumps and be important uh, part of the picture. Not just so something that you happen to throw into the background because you need to cover a uh, fill space. It's part of the composition. And um, when, you, uh, when you're accurate about it, you will find that there is a nice feeling about paintings that are having accuracy. Uh, I, I think there's nothing more irritating than seeing somebody fake a landscape and not really, and not really have any concern about what it, really, what it really is, what its anatomy really is. It's like a bad portrait of a human. A bad portrait of a landscape is just as offensive to me as a bad portrait of a human being. So here we have this wonderful trusty brush, which, um, which is made by Winsor Newton, and it's a number 303. It's uh, very, I'm afraid it's uh, probably more money than it ought to be, but uh, what isn't? Um, this was a six dollar brush. It's absolutely tiny, but as you can see, nothing else is going to do the job like this. So, um, uh, well, it's essential. And you don't need that many brushes. I find that when I, when I tell people what kind of supplies to buy, uh, I don't think that you have to have handfuls of brushes. You can have four at the most and they will do the job. As you can see, the technique of doing this grass is absolutely vital to trying to get the details. And I keep doing it so that I can show you that you start at the bottom and then you, and then you release the brush. When you do this, you will find that it becomes less and less of a problem to do paintings like this with, with grasses and weeds. And I, I, I have a feeling that um, when the color is observed and the technique is, 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 is secure, that you can probably do uh, the largest painting in the world of, of these grasses and weeds and have it uh, come off. Come off. Um, I'd like you to also know that just behind this um, strip of, of uh, beach land, there is, a, um, there is the Great South Bay. And in the Great South Bay, at this time of year, and I don't know what they're doing there, but they were there when this shot was taken. Uh, you can't see it because it's not in this picture, but I'm just telling you about it, is a tugboat a New York City tugboat. And it is working, uh, apparently, uh, laying some kind of a pipeline or something. But it's very active out there in the Great South Bay. And it is, uh, it is um, moving things around and chugging along and making little waves. And it's about as, about as funny as any tugboat can possibly be. And it's out there working. So um, there's, another, uh, there's another little uh, tourist attraction which you might want to go and see, uh, whether, whether you're uh, uh, drawn to tugboats or not. The point is that a tugboat outside of New York Harbor is definitely out of place. And um, the, um, the dredge and barge that, uh, that they are working with is the rustiest, ugliest looking piece of maritime equipment you can imagine. But we almost was going to stop and do that. And then I thought, well, I'm not going to subject anybody to this really ugly looking thing. So we passed it by. and. Um, and we got this one instead, which I think is probably with a, a better choice. But do go see if you can catch a get a load of that little tugboat that is out there chugging around on the Great South Bay. And uh, on that note, I'm going to take a break for just a moment because our grasses are beginning to take shape. And then I think I'm going to fake some seagulls for you because they were there even though we didn't catch them on the tape. I'll be right back. Don't go too far away.
is the general wind-up for this winter trip to the beach. Um, the Robert Moses State Park, which I've um, been attempting to interpret here. One final thing that I think I'll show you is that when the sun catches grasses, uh, they turn light, and you can do it this way. You can take a palette knife and you can merely scratch a leaf um, that catches the light once in a while. You can scratch it if you have prepared the background with a light enough color. And I think that you'll find that this is sort of an intriguing way of doing it. Um, it, it, is a, uh, it is a technique which has been done often. And if you overdo it, it's like anything else. It's tiresome. But if you use it uh, uh, sparingly and you do it uh, effectively, then there's perfectly uh, there's no, no reason at all why it isn't a very acceptable technique of interpreting the grass. Um, uh, when this was uh, sh uh, shot, um, I see that there are some areas of, of sort of grayish tone that look like they have been, like the wind has sort of blown this, and I think I'm going to try and get those in there, the grayish tones whereby the, the pumice or whatever it is that has gone and blown itself up onto this dune is, um, is uh, recorded. It does, in fact, have, have a nice texture to it, and um, the, uh, that's all what makes the, uh, what you might call the uh, tooth of the painting. Uh, up here we have a few more, or what you might call, uh, strange and unexplainable uh, polka dots and texture places. But while all of this was taking place, there were some hearty souls out uh, enjoying this uh, beach that I'm talking about. They're going to be so far away on this particular painting that you probably won't be able to really distinguish them, except that we have to try and make it look as though these people are in fact walking along the beach, which they were. And um, people walking along the beach, you have to make sure that they're the right proportion. And if I can possibly um, uh, show you that, this, uh, that these people are fully clothed, obviously they're not going to be in beach clothes. They're, they, they had heavy winter things on, and that, that is probably easy to, not easy, but uh, something to be observed and to be watched. There is also somebody who is carrying a child on their on their shoulders, and uh, th th I don't, I'm not sure that I can make this come off, but it certainly is worth the effort that um, somebody, uh, there's a daddy carrying a little child on his shoulders. I'm, I, I think maybe that's probably not a good idea. But there is obviously people walking along this beach, and uh, I find that uh, that's, uh, humans in pictures are, all, are always extremely interesting to me, and if you can make it believable, Namely, the heavy clothing. Uh, obviously, they are not uh, little people who just have bikinis on. They are clothed, fully clothed, in a, on a winter day. Uh, the um, the need to uh, the, to show people, I think, is a good one because it gives you some idea of proportion of how enormous. Uh, because we all know the size of a human, and therefore we all can. Uh, well, those two or three are too too close, too equidistant, and so for interest and composition, we'll put two next to one another, which is a better composition and also um, uh, gives you more people. So the two of them are better together than just three. Mozart always had three of uh, three of a kind together. And uh, even numbers is not a good idea, but I'm going to leave mine at four. Now, uh, seagulls and Canada geese in this kind of an environment have to be so subtly done that I even hesitate to show you how. I have taken almost all the color off this brush, and all that is left is a little bit of tinted turpentine. And I think that all the, that, that is, needs to be done is to, is to simply indicate with a very slight uh, but uh, so, so, so slight that it's almost uh, imperceptible because that's the way they were. They, uh, they, um, they uh, are, uh, y you must be very careful with birds. It's very difficult to, to, make, uh, uh, to make birds that are in the right proportion, otherwise they look like eagles. And, we, um, and obviously we know there are no eagles, but there was a multitude of seagulls there today, one particularly huge one that I thought was an aeroplane. But anyway, the birds do fly uh, in wonderful patterns, uh, and sometimes no patterns at all. And in, in this kind of a weather, there are no patterns. But once in a while, there is in fact a, um, the ability to see uh, the white of a 
seagull. And if you, if you can catch that, the white of a seagull is a very identifiable. You will see that just a dot will tell you that it is not a blackbird, but it is in fact a seagull. And uh, seagulls are notoriously, uh, notoriously brilliant in the sun when they uh, fly. So that may be a little bit heavy, but I just wanted you to see how you, how you can be accurate and still uh, delicate at the same time. Well, let me, let me pull this down and see if I can make that bird accurate. To, to try and make the paint do what you want it to do in just a few strokes. Well, yeah, that's, that's okay. Well, now, there is, of course, the need to, um, to do some refining, maybe a few more of the, of the, of the grasses going, gro growing into the foreground. There's somebody right up on the dunes, and if, we could, if I could just catch him very slightly in his red jacket, then, uh, then we'll have another larger figure because he would be closer. Um, so let's see if I can get a figure right on the top of the dune, looking out or just simply walking along the top of it, which is of course a no-no, and um, uh, the uh, conservationists are going to be furious at this, at this thing, but um, the, the presence of human beings in a painting is always extremely interesting to me. And because he, the, it gives you some feeling of, of humanity involved. And uh, there's, his, there's his jacket. Let me see if I can, let me see if I can get, his, get the, um, the darker color of his trousers. Not too, not too dark. And hmm. see, when people walk, uh, it's, it's, uh, they, tend to, uh, they tend to be going somewhere. And, <laughs> and um, if you're going to try to catch them in their, in their phase of walking, they, uh, you are, you're, you're good, and I'm not sure that I'm that good. But he did have a cap on that was stuck out in the front. So anyway, uh oh, that little one in the back, that little gizmo in the back is wrong. He did not have a hat with a brim. It was a hat with a, uh, a brim, a cap with a visor. So it would seem that maybe that's a, a, a good enough figure. He is bigger than the people on the beach, but he is also in somewhat uh, decent proportion. Well, it looks like um, maybe as, as long as I have some time left, I can continue to give you some more, some five more. Well, okay, I have a long, much longer time to go, and that means that I can actually probably concentrate a little bit more on some foreground of these, of these grasses, which I would do if I was on my own and not, not worried about the time, the time going by. So time is always a, a very a precious thing when you're doing a painting. You have to be able to do it. You have to be able to have the time to do it properly. And the foreground and the weeds of this painting are, are just as important as the rest of it. Uh, I think I'm not going to worry about uh, concentrating on the tower. The tower, I think, maybe speaks for itself. It needs maybe a little bit of work. But, but, the, but the thing that does need to, to have the attention paid to it are these clumps in the foreground. Um, as long as I have my, my trusty brush full of a very fine color, I'm going to uh, part from tradition and sign this on the other side of the painting because there are too many weeds over there. And that means that if I, um, if I, can, if I get way down here in, this, in the right hand, uh, left hand corner rather, this is where I would sign it. And um, it's always amusing to me if I can hide the signature a little bit instead of being so bold as to put it out and just hide it among the weeds. And uh, many times I would do paintings in the past that were simply called weeds, and then I would sign it. And for years, I was known as Weeds Windrow. They thought it was my first name. And so here I am once again playing the role of Weeds Windrow. And I think maybe I have room and my brush is behaving well enough to be able to do 1993 instead of just the apostrophe three. So all of these things are, and, and as you step back, you, that's not really as visible as it is with that, with that close up. There was a fishing trawler off in the distance that uh, was covering a lot of ground and I can put him in because it also tells you something else, that no matter what the weather, there's always some body out there uh, needing to earn a living and uh, that trawler was, well that's not dark enough, the trawler was out there uh, dragging nets for something, whatever they're dragging, maybe flounder, maybe Certainly not clams in the ocean, but uh, probably flounder. We get a rather wonderful, a wonderful um, uh, selection of uh, freshly caught fish from the Great South Bay. And this this trawler was um, was sort of indistinct, but he was out there definitely with his little radar. Um, 
the little radar tower is sticking up and um, uh, chugging along and dra dra dragging his net. So we, once again, we have another uh, another um, activity taking place right in our own shores. And the um, so so for the for the business of going out and working from life, you not only figure out, find out how to paint some of this stuff, but you also find out a great deal besides as a bonus. I think that the tower probably can use a little bit of darkness here underneath the the main part it's, it looks to me on the on the uh, on the close up shots that we took that this is quite dark and um, and it uh, there's some texture in here somewhere that uh, that um, needs to be attended to because as i said if it's not recognizable it's not it's not it's pointless to do it if you don't recognize it and these nice vertical lines on this tower there's some people crawling up there um, the vertical lines on the tower are the identifying things of this tower. Not only just the color, but um, there it is. And so, well, that's a little bit too obvious. I'm going to cut them down a little bit by uh, scumbling them somewhat. Well, as I said before, uh, naturally the time, uh, time, time passes, but we did have a nice leisurely uh, ending to this one. Uh, instead of my being breathless and trying to get a last few things in uh, and not successfully, I think maybe this probably worked out very nicely that this, that this t uh, tower was able to get some detail. Now, don't forget, do go and see all these wonderful places and experience it as you do. Um, I hope that you like this series of paintings of landscapes. I do bring still lives in once in a while, as you can see, the breads and the, tum and the, um, the well, whatever those are, apples. Uh, still life is great, flowers are better, landscapes are wonderful, and working with the local scene, I think, is probably the important thing. Uh, the uh, producers of this program here are down in Washington, D.C. at the ACE Awards to see how anything is happening and to see whether or not they, um, the cable vision is, uh, well, obviously in the running. So um, when you see this program the next time, you will know whether or not uh, we pulled off a fast one. Thanks for watching. This is Pat Windrow at the Cable Easel once again. Thanks again and um, keep painting if you can. Keep your brushes clean. Bye-bye.